Journalists really need to be independent. And that's where community journalism, independent journalism, uh, is such a contrast with what we're getting from the mass media. You know, when you look at what is in the New York Times, when you look at what is in the New York Post and these various daily newspapers, for it, the ones, you know, you don't, we don't have to talk about the Wall Street Journal editorial page. We don't have to talk about Fox News. Talk about CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times and all things considered in the morning edition and PBS NewsHour. Let's talk about the really quality news media. And you look at who's paying their bills. You look at the massive corporate money that is coming in that is the profit margin for those outlets or in the case of so-called public broadcasting, what makes them possible, as they say, made possible by, you know. Who makes possible the uh, series that we're now getting about the Vietnam War on PBS? Bank of America. They believe in freedom, Bank of America. Is that why anti-war demonstrators, I'm not advocating this, is, is that why anti-war demonstrators burned down the Bank of America in Santa Barbara? during the Vietnam War because the Bank of America was such a paragon of democratic virtue? You know, of course not. Bank of America was profiteering. I got, you know, I was involved in, with a lot of other people where David Rockefeller and Chase Bank of that time, Chase Manhattan as it was called, they were profiteering off the apartheid regime in South Africa. That's their job. Their job is to maximize profits. And these media outlets then and now are hooked in with their funding stream. This is their political economy. This is how they function. And so truth needs to be put out in very small doses. If we, for instance, are to walk around Columbus Circle, as I did with my brother a couple hours ago, there's a big statue. And I was really stunned to read the words under the statue because it was complete lies about Columbus. So why is that that an honored place and the honored words are right there in 2017 and we're encouraged to believe that that history is real and we should be deferential and perhaps most importantly, we should be silent. Aldous Huxley, in his introduction to Brave New World, said that lies are powerful, but even more powerful is silence. That's the essence of propaganda. And we know in our own lifetimes how dangerous, how destructive silence can be. People in powerful positions, in government, in corporations, they don't even particularly care what you think or what I think, as long as we don't speak up, as long as we don't take action. And if you look at the successful changes that we can be proud of in our country and around the world, it's because people refused to be silent, because people recognized what the ACT UP organization used as a motto three decades ago, when the silence was killing people with HIV AIDS, ACT UP said, silence equals death. Not only in that situation, but it's been true decade after decade. And so if you go back 500 plus years ago, and you see that today, history is still being rendered to us, as though genocide of Native Americans didn't happen, then that's a template. That is a pattern. That is a way in which we're being encouraged, tacitly messaged, to believe that that's OK, that it's better to be silent. Everything we have to be proud of in our country is because people refuse to take the conventional wisdom they refuse to simply internalize and accept that first draft of history, whether it was given 100 years ago by the Hearst newspapers in this city 
or whether it's being given today by the New York Times. And I think part of our challenge, whatever sort of journalism and programming we're doing, is to say that not only are we going to be as candid and understanding and honest as we can be about history, but also about the present time. And we're willing to not only speak truth to power, but maybe even more importantly, as journalists, as human beings, to speak truth about power. You can watch every April 4th and every King holiday weekend on the mass media, any cable channels almost, and you'll get the I Have a Dream speech. You won't get any mention of what Dr. King said at Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967. When he spoke in the current parlance, some inconvenient truths. He spoke truths that could not be accepted by the mass media then, it can't be accepted by the mass media now. And I think as journalists, as producers, as people who are creatively helping to make change in our society, we disrupt that silence. We recognize that in communities around the country we have the potential to break the silences by being real about the current time and also, as best as we can, making the connections between the past and the present and recognizing that our consciousness and our actions to some degree become circumscribed when we internalize this dynamic that George Orwell described as those who control the past control the future, those who control the present control the past. And so those in the mass media control in the present are so eager to control the past because so much is at stake in the future. For them, it is property rights. For them, it is profits. It is monetary profits. And it is huge multi-billion dollars in profits in terms of the weapons trade, in terms of real estate, in terms of de facto redlining, in terms of all sorts of keeping wages suppressed, keeping voting rights suppressed. This is part of the messaging that is put forward and recast as free enterprise and all the rest of it. Dr. King talked about this fixation on property rights at Riverside Church, and he also talked about the profit motive being out of control. And it's right in that passage, in that sentence, actually, that we don't get to see on television, where he said that it is those priorities, the property rights, the profit motives, out of control, that fuel what he called the deadly triplet, the deadly triplet of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. And it doesn't go away, as we discovered, just because we get some nice sounding TV shows, and we get an African American president, and we get a lot of platitudes from the mass media. It doesn't go away just because the news media have made progress and our society as a whole have made progress because at the same time that zeal to protect the property rights, the mega property rights, and that zeal to go ahead and reinforce these massive profits that are being taken by those who already have disproportionately so much already, that continues to be the operative dynamic. So, here we are in 2017, and I think we have a tremendous opportunity. There are barriers to entry to creating media that have dropped so much. Uh, people, whether it's cable television or online or all these different uh, capacities that we have that we didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago, to reach out, to create, to engage in journalism that doesn't simply rely on the official sources, 
but realizes that so much of the question, you know, when you do a talk show, the question is, whose voices will be heard? 